the hard data on dangerous heat right where you live. It's like 33 degrees inside. All summer in 50 homes in five cities, our exclusive experiment revealed a silent killer. I sleep maybe two and a half hours, half an hour at a time. It can rob you of sleep, shorten your life. And your heart has to work harder. Even end your life. Here's Tara Carmen to show you what the heat sensors our investigative units supplied, measured, and to break down the risk to millions of Canadians. The heat, the humidity is sweltering. Sweltering heat today. There's been a heat warning. Heat warning has been issued by the health unit. 50 sensors, five cities, so many stories from a long, hot summer. Windsor, Ontario. Greg Walton was feeling extreme heat from day one. I've taken a shower. I'm already starting to wet my shirt. I'm sweating profusely. Vancouver, July 18th. Samantha Johnson was dreading the summer ahead. If I do too much, I just perspire. Just It just pours off me because it's so warm. Everywhere we measured, there were similar stories. It was like almost um, 10 p.m. at night. The temperature at this time is 31. We found that temperatures inside were often far hotter than outside. Many people tend to think that if they remain indoors, they're safe. The problem is, is that indoor environments can get really hot. Ottawa professor Glenn Kenny studies the body's ability to lose heat. Looking at your data, there's no question that we have to be concerned. His research found people can generally handle indoor temperatures up to 26 Celsius. Your body has to try to lose more heat and your heart has to work harder to try and enhance that heat dissipation. So as you get above 26, it becomes more stressful on the body. CBC's analysis found half the homes in our test were above 26 degrees most of the time. Let's have a look at the data. You've been, yeah, above 28 degrees, um, even at nighttime. I sleep maybe two and a half hours half an hour at a time. It's just too flippin' hot. 79-year-old Samantha Johnson feels she has nowhere to go, day or night. I have heart failure, so as soon as I do any type of movement, the sweat just pours off of me. And so I could go to the library and I could stay there until six or seven, and then I could come back to this and not sleep all night, and then get up and go back to the library. Those politicians have got it all figured out, don't they? We also showed our findings to emergency doctor Aaron Orkin. The homes here are holding steady in the like 28, 29, uh, just shy of 30 degrees all the time uh, with almost no reprieve. Six weeks later, our sensors found that Greg Walton's apartment had the most stays over 26 degrees. Wow, like so it's like if it's 26 outside, it's like 33 degrees inside and I'm running fans and it's still that much hotter and it's still that much more humid and it's just like wow. But it has such a big difference on the quality of life and just the quality of experience that you're in when you're in your place. It's not safe and not, not good for your health to be in that kind of heat in an ongoing way period. That will be more dangerous for people who have other health conditions. But also it means that over time people who are exposed to heat in an ongoing way will have shorter life expectancy. The heat became a life and death matter for 88-year-old Herman Gron, one of our participants who lived here in Surrey, BC. He was in and out of the hospital with breathing problems. Days after we last spoke to him, Herman passed away on August 14th of heart failure. That's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy at so many different levels. People home who are suffering from heat-related illness back into a home setting that simply cannot cool down the idea that medications or other treatments will fix their health problems, their uh, respiratory disease, as this gentleman felt uh, and experienced, or their, uh, their other health problems, that they'll be able to address those without getting the heat under control is equally absurd. Community advocate Marcia Bryan says now that the facts are in, it's time to act. Wow. <laughs> is this for real? To actually see the proof of it. Speaking is one thing, but when you actually see the proof of it, it's alarming. Hopefully with this, will come something amazing out of it. 
Now, that's alarming enough, but heat isn't the only hazard. CBC's investigative unit also tracked the humidity using precision sensors, just like this one. Leah Hendry breaks down the dangers when summer swelter knocks out your natural defenses. Last week in Montreal, a heat wave brought hot, humid days. But when the sun went down, there was still no relief. And in eastern and central Canada, you have the added effect of humidity, which can keep buildings hot well into the night. It is currently 28.5 degrees in my apartment. We spoke to three of our 50 heat monitor volunteers about what the data said about that humidity effect. First up, Leah Raymond Marshall. It's roasting in her newly built student co-op that doesn't include air conditioning. As soon as you start trying to get to sleep, you can feel how hot you are. She says she could buy an AC unit, but it would block the access to her balcony. During last week's heat wave, the inside humidity was nearly 70%. It's like, you know when you open the oven and you get the like burst of hot air? It feels like that, but all the time. Um, I'm hyper aware of how much I'm sweating right now. So this is our environmental chamber. Researcher so Danielle Gagnon has studied the added effect of humidity physiologically on the body. Our main defense mechanism to stay cool is to sweat. And what really cools us off is the evaporation of sweat. The more humid it is in the air, the harder it is for that process to occur. So we might still produce sweat, but instead of it evaporating, it'll drip off onto the floor and then we lose all of its cooling power. What ends up happening inside of our body when we're not able to cool off? Our internal body temperature will increase more for a given environment. Um, that can obviously lead to dangerous things if, if body temperature increases to very high levels. There. Yeah. Good. Bernadette Mamo lives with her 86-year-old mother in Toronto. Both of them have high blood pressure. We got the doctor's appointment on Friday. We can get out of this heat. They tried installing an air conditioner, but it blew the fuses in the old building her mother's been renting for more than 50 years. I worry about her getting heat stroke, even though she's not outside. The CBC heat monitors show that with the humidity, the evening temperature inside felt as high as 31 degrees. How does that make Mamo feel? Ugh. Maddening, aggravating. We're paying rent. I'd like to be able to stay in my home comfortably. But it's like we can't. Even from my in Raymond Marshall's apartment, with the humidity, it got up to 34 degrees. And that's not all. When we looked at the data, it was 10 degrees hotter in here at some point than it was outside. Okay. Meaning that it was 10 degrees cooler outside. Really? <gasps> I should, maybe I should start sleeping outside. <laughs> it's surprising too, because you said your building was built in 2020. You know, when you make a building in Montreal, you think about how the, the cold is going to affect. Well, we should start thinking about how the heat is going to affect us. New buildings need to be designed so that they don't uh, store heat uh, in the summer. Dr. David Kaiser says the city's daytime cooling centers don't help people at night when the risk is the highest. If we want to be realistic and we're thinking about uh, reducing that risk at night, then it really comes down to uh, building, housing, um, and uh, urban planning. Finally, when humidity was factored in, we clocked the apartment that felt the hottest of all in our project, and it belongs to... Hi, how are you doing? How are you? MBA student Sridharan Ben Kiparam. The humidity in your apartment was 70% one day in July, at the beginning oh, of July. Okay. And you actually, your apartment here reached the highest temperature of any of the other sensors that oh, we have okay. in Canada. It reached a temperature of feeling like about 39 degrees in here. That's pretty high. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, it's, it's really surprising, but then yeah, it's, it's really loud. I'm surprised I got through this. Now that Ben Kiparam has graduated, he's looking for a new apartment his quality of life, something with shade or better yet air conditioning will be a priority. So Tara, I'm curious about something. The federal government has a climate adaptation plan that aims to eliminate deaths from extreme heat by 2040. What's your sense of how realistic that is? 
Yeah, so my colleagues at What on Earth put that question to the federal environment minister, Stephen Gubo, and he said this is not something the federal government can do on its own because a lot of what needs to happen, like setting up systems to identify and check in on vulnerable people or changing building codes, is actually the responsibility of provinces or cities. So meeting that target depends how well everyone works together. And even with that, though, that target is still 17 years away. I mean, clearly there are people who need help right now. Yes, 17 years is a really long time. And Gibo says the target is 2040 because things like retrofitting all the buildings in Canada so that they don't overheat are expensive and take time. But it's clear we need to protect those who are vulnerable much sooner than that. So the federal plan notes extreme heat waves are the deadliest weather events in Canada. And we've just heard now that the BC government is proposing changes to the building code to require that new buildings have a room designed not to exceed 26 degrees. All right, Tara Carmen in Vancouver, thank you. And there's much more of Tara and her team's findings on cbcnews.ca. You can check that out and see how they did it. Next, some students return to school and find libraries half empty. Taking away books without anyone's knowledge is considered censorship. The fight to keep books on the shelves, next. High school libraries stripped of books in the name of diversity. What sort of a library is left for my child? Many thrown out because they're more than 15 years old. Erasing history is what they're doing. Anne Frank and Harry Potter, two casualties of a literary purge. Angelina King broke the story that has everyone talking and the Ontario government taking action. She breaks down why a school board culled centuries of work and wisdom and simply threw it all away. I did go to the fiction section of li my library and I saw this, empty shelves on the first day of school. And sections that have been completely erased. Raina Takata says more than half of the books at her Mississauga School Library are gone, including her favorites like Harry Potter and The Hunger Games. Taking away books without anyone's knowledge is considered censorship. CBC News has learned thousands of books have been removed within the Peel District School Board, many likely ending up in the landfill. Like most libraries in Canada, Peel schools are to weed out books that are damaged or outdated, but the board is going further. According to an internal document reviewed by CBC, books that aren't inclusive or reinforce racist content or stereotypes also have to go. That was put into place in response to a ministry directive, mandating the board undergo a diversity audit as part of a review on systemic discrimination within the board. But it appears that was misinterpreted. At first, neither Ontario's Education Ministry nor the Minister's office would comment for the story. But after it was published, the Minister told CBC he told the board to end the process immediately. In a statement saying, Ontario is committed to ensuring that the addition of new books better reflects the rich diversity of our communities. It is offensive, illogical and counterintuitive to remove books from years past that educate students on Canada's history, anti-Semitism or celebrated literary classics. My son is in grade 10. Parent Tom Ellard says he thinks the school board misinterpreted the ministry's directive. Ellard and other parents and students are concerned with how the process has been unfolding. I'm not comfortable giving anyone the power to be the arbiter on a huge basis of what's right and wrong from a library's perspective about the totality of ideas that are available. Takata, who's Japanese, says she's worried books with themes of race like Japanese-Canadian internment will disappear. It shows students that it never happened. At Takata's school and others, the process has led to confusion. Because staff are supposed to focus on weeding books published in 2008 or prior, it appears some have tossed nearly all books published in that time frame. I brought these two books, The Very Hungry Caterpillar and The Diary of Anne Frank. Diane Lawson says she spoke with teachers who are upset those books were removed, seemingly based on publication date alone. That doesn't make sense. Okay. 
Lawson and Ellard created a group called Libraries Not Landfills after they say teachers reached out in hopes they could raise awareness. It's important that those challenging ideas are there and available to us. If they're not there, how are we providing a learning environment for our children? The process itself uh, rolled out wrong. Trustee and School Board Chair David Green says after trustees learned about the process, they implemented changes in hopes of ensuring transparency and accountability. Now, if a book is tossed for not being inclusive, staff must record it. We want to make sure it's done properly that all students feel included and part of the, the process. So I have talked to a few of my friends. But so far, they don't feel that way. And our decisions and thoughts haven't been considered. I'm worried about like my chance with other students uh, when coming up to university that have access to all those books that I don't have. So Angelina, I am so curious, what is the school board saying about this? Well, we reached back out to the school board today after we heard from the minister to see if the board would adhere to his request to stop the process immediately. Didn't hear uh, back from the board on that one. But I previously asked the board several questions, things like how many books have already been thrown out, how much will it cost to replace them. The board didn't address any of our questions. It did say that it's working to ensure books within the board are culturally responsive, inclusive, and diverse. Okay, so more questions there. I, one thing that struck me watching this is, you know, stories come from all sorts of places, but where did this one come from? So my colleague and I both worked on it. We are with the Enterprise Unit at CBC here in Toronto, and we actually got an email tip from a student who was concerned, quite concerned about all of this. The student told us that they learned about it from a concerned teacher. So the student brought uh, the information to us, sent us some photos. Of course, we asked a lot of follow-up questions. Uh, they gave us the information for the Libraries Not Landfill group. So we tracked down the organizer, and then you're put in touch with all kinds of people, and things kind of start going from there. All right, there's clearly more to do on this. Certainly. Angelina King, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. And another story we're working on, how the dangerous art of storm chasing can shed new light on climate change. We are currently in between this complex of storms and a whole lot of boundaries and new storms that are going up. Storm chasers live to follow monster weather events and some warn climate change is making those storms more dangerous. Well, you got the extreme dry temperatures that uh, come in and really cause problems. The National breaks down how. But next, a Canadian teen hits the video game Big Leagues. It was really exciting. I never expected this to actually happen. How this 13-year-old struck a deal with Sony in our moment. So this is a trailer for a new video game coming out on PlayStation 5, but here's the best part. It was entirely developed by a 13-year-old from British Columbia. So Max Trust of BC is too young to vote or drive, but his video game career is already blasting off into the stratosphere. The tech prodigy is our moment. I'm Max, I'm 13 years old, and I'm an indie game developer with my own game studio. I started working on Astralander a few years ago. It was originally just a small hobby project, but now it's coming exclusively to PlayStation 5. So when I was originally developing the game, I was using at a few events to get feedback on the demo. And while I was at one of these events, Seattle Indies Expo, um, I met the PlayStation team. They liked the game so much that they decided that they would offer me the chance to bring it to PlayStation 5. It was really exciting. I never expected this to actually happen. Um, I thought this was just going to be a small release on PC Steam. It's just amazing. So the Cyberquacks are, have stolen the most valuable programs, uh, MVPs, and you have to rescue them from the giant uh, rubber ducks with laser eyes. I received so much positive feedback and help from the community. They love the game so much, and then when they find out it's developed by a 13-year-old, they're just really shocked and amazed. I started game development when, when I was around six years old. It really is a dream come true. Never give up, always follow your dreams, and you can do anything.
13. He's 13. Max, you are incredible. Apparently, what one of the very cool things about this video game is that it uses the DualSense controller. So you get physical feedback when you push the buttons uh, and, and triggers and whatnot. And of course, Max is already working on a sequel, as you do. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime, on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.